Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Ardmore Seventy Adventist Church. Welcome to those who are joining us on the live stream. We are going to begin tonight praising God with hymn number 523, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. For those joining on the live stream. <laughs> yeah, 523. But we could go with 522. My hope is. Yeah, let's go. Sorry. I was I had said 523 and I was I was getting confused and I'm like, what's going on? Okay. 522, here we go. My hope is built on nothing less from the beginning. it up since we were switching things up. We're going to number 518 instead. 518. Uh, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises. We're playing 518. No, no. Well, yes. If you want to stand on the promises, you can stand. This isn't our opening, but you can stand. Oh, 
Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. And we will now remain standing for our opening song that has been selected for tonight, number 507, Moment by Moment. Oh, man. 
Thank you guys for singing. You may be seated. Again tonight, as we get started, we'd like to invite you to gather with a couple people, a couple friends, maybe someone that you haven't prayed with yet um, this week, and take a moment to ask God's Spirit to be present and that our hearts would be drawn closer to Jesus. We can have some prayer together. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, once again, we ask and seek for your Holy Spirit to help us see the truth of these things. And maybe tonight, more than any other night, we ask for special perception to be granted to us that we may hear you we ask that you would bless and be with us tonight, Lord, as we turn to your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, you realize after tonight, we only have three more nights. And that's it. It's like fast. <laughs> but I am glad to present tonight. It's one of my favorite topics. It's one that I've grown with myself over the years and um, I keep coming to this place, and that's the place I want to share with you tonight. You know well where we've been. It's on the screen. We take a step tonight, and we take another one, and then a final one Friday night. But tonight, I like to pitch this as a doorway. You know, our young society today, they love the ideas of portals and openings and supernatural you know, things like this. It's not meant to be that, but it is meant to be this in a, a psychological kind of way. This is uh, something that we have to go through. And I hope that in some way tonight that you will all choose to go this way and to follow this. So I want to read to you a quote that shores this idea up. There is to be in the churches a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, but it will not move upon those who have not humbled themselves before the Lord and opened the door of their heart of God. It's from Maranatha. So we've talked about repentance. We've talked about confession. Now we're going to really look at what 
what is this idea of opening the door of our heart? Because this is the step of steps that I've been wanting to get to so that we can talk about all the fun stuff. Really, tomorrow is the fun lecture and Friday's even better than that. But tonight is that critical doorway, entryway, that portal that we got to go through. And I like to preface it in an odd way um, by quoting one of my favorite novels that I love to read. The book is much better than any movie that's ever been produced. It was one of the great Christian classics of all times by Charles Dickens. And I want to open with the opening paragraph of that book. And he says in the preface of the book that if you do not understand this opening paragraph, the rest of the story makes no sense. And it goes this way. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, the chief mourner. Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. That is our topic tonight. It's why I choose Graveyard Dead. We're going to look at what in the world has that got to do with opening the heart. We're going to see it has everything. The scriptural testimony of that is found, and we're going to spend some time tonight in Romans, the sixth chapter, that deals primarily with this topic. If you were in the book Steps to Christ, chapter 5 and chapter 6 would also be rooted right here with Romans, chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So Paul spends five chapters speaking about justification by faith and confession and repentance. And now he begins to turn his thought process towards this idea of dying. In fact, in this quote, there is no safety for one who has merely what kind of religion? A legal religion. That means Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. <laughs> it means I see, I believe, I got the doctrines down, I got prophecy down. That's a legal religion. It's all true, but we're after something tonight that is a game changer. And that's what this quote's about. A form of godliness, the Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. You must experience a death to self and must live unto God. Self is not to be consulted. Pride, self-love, selfishness, avarice, covetousness, love of the world, hatred, suspicion, jealousy, evil surmisings must all be subdued and sacrifice forever. There must be, uh, in other words, rest in peace of Curtis Damon Sneed. I've got to be laid low. I've got to check out. I've got to be put out of my, of my misery. So how does one die? And Romans will go on in verse 3 and say, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? So baptism was primarily to be this, this, we're going to see in a minute, it's much more than a symbol. It's an action. It is a, it is a covenant that you enter into with God. And when you were baptized, it was supposed to be a funeral. It was supposed to be a checking out of the old way. It was supposed to be, as we'll see later, some other interesting words that are used with this. But it was supposed to be first and primarily a death of self. This is why in John chapter 3, verse 3, the very basics of the gospel, Jesus tells Nicodemus when he's reciting all of the legal religion, Jesus says to him, you must be, you remember, born again. And the only reason why one would need to be born again or the only way that one can be born again is if there's been a death, a funeral first. And when I've told you my testimony, so much of my life, I knew nothing of dying to self. I had legal religion. I understood some doctrines. I did Bible study number nine, buried and forgotten by God with the amazing facts. But I knew nothing of coming up out of that water, being dead to self. And then now alive to newness to God. 
And this is exactly where Acts chapter 2, verse 38 takes us. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, you remember that text. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, everyone, for the remission of sins. And so baptism is next, or what we'll call it, I call it, is a death to self. And when we have that idea, we won't be confused like most of Christianity is. Christianity is confused about baptism. Some don't even believe that you're supposed to do it. Some believe it's just kind of like, oh, a little symbol. It's a profession of your faith that you believe in Jesus. Well, those may be true, but primarily it is really you're going to your death. Literally, the way that God sees it, you're going to a death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31 says, and Paul says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, that I die daily. So it's not just a one-time death, but really it's going to be a daily death. In 2 Corinthians, Paul would say the same thing. In chapter 4, he would say that I carry always about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Christ might be continually manifested in me. So we're going to be talking about the initial idea of baptism or dying to self. And then we're going to also talk about kind of the daily dying to self as well. And it's beautiful because you have to die and then you have to stay dead. And if you will stay dead, <laughs> that's the trick. The life of Christ continually is manifested in you. There are a lot of confusions about this, but we're going to clear them up tonight. In fact, in the Old Testament, the truest form of repentance, when they really was in a repentant mode, they would put sackcloth and ashes on. And the sackcloth and the ashes were symbols of the grave. They were pictures of, of people that were saying to the Lord, essentially, we're dead. We've sinned against you. We're dead. We have no life before you. We trust in you. It was a symbol of faith. It was a symbol of kind of baptism in a sense. So in other words, the old me that was so easily overtaken by sin, because this is what we're getting at. The daemon that was constantly fallen, getting up, doing good for a little while, doing the same thing over and over again, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And through the process of back and forth, the consequences of sin begin to mound and mound and mound and mound and mound and mound. God forgives. Sure, you get back on the horse, then you go back to the ditch again, and God forgives, but the consequences don't leave you. And they start to destroy your life. I never went through the door at my baptism. Knew nothing of it. Didn't understand this at all in any kind of way. And the Bible is clear, the beautiful promises of going through the doorway, going through this idea of death and baptism. On the other side of that door in, in Romans chapter 6, I just got some kind of quick descriptors of some Bible text. Romans 6, verse 22, it's where we have our fruit into sanctification. It's where now God can begin the work. It's in Colossians. It's where spiritual circumcision takes place. In the book of Colossians 3, it's where the new man is born. In Hebrews chapter 8, it's when we receive the new heart and the new covenant. In Galatians, it's when we become children of God. In Galatians 4, 6, it's where we enter into the adoption with Christ. We're now cut out from the old loins of Adam where we were born into, right? Fallen natures were connected to Adam, but at baptism, it's where now you are dead to Adam and you're alive now in the second Adam. It has all of this beautiful imagery of what it's supposed to be like. And even more than that, here's what I wish I would have known at my baptism. Listen to this. The Christian's oath of allegiance. So it's even more than just dying in the newness of life, but it's an, it's an oath that you make to God. As Christians submit to the solemn rite of baptism, he registers the vow that they make to be true to him. Who's the he? This is Jesus. This vow is their oath of allegiance. They are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thus they are united with the three great powers of heaven. They pledge themselves to renounce the world and to observe the laws of the kingdom of God. Henceforth, they are to walk in the newness of life. And so when you get up here and, and you have someone that's about to be baptized, God recognizes what you're saying. Because this is why we do it in submersion under the water. The water is a picture of the grave. 
This is why you lay backwards, like in a position of death. Your arms are folded. Your eyes are closed and you hold your breath. It's a picture of being now dead. And the pastor really stands, the one baptizing you, stands in the position of God, recognizing you're saying to God, I am dead now. And then when you are picked up, you don't pick yourself up. The pastor picks you up. It's a picture of God. And when you come up and you're standing straight up, your eyes open and you do what? The first thing is. <gasps> it's a symbol of now the Holy Spirit taking residence deep with inside in a way that he didn't have access before. He sets up now as Lord and master of your life and begins to work out righteousness in your life. So in other words, baptism or death to self is a recognition to God, not of particular sins. We'll talk about that in the moment or really tomorrow, but in recognition of sin, the sinful condition that has separated me from God. And it's important that we understand that because it's that separation that's got us all messed up. It's that not actually having died to self, not truly being baptized. And a lot of people have been baptized a lot of people have been rebaptized, but it was really just commitments and getting wet. And if you're not really dead to self in the way that we still haven't got to what it means yet, you're still thinking, okay, dead to self, dead to sin. No, we're not yet there. But until then, you're, you're in the problem that 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 has. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So you've taken all your Bible studies, you've done all your baptismal studies, and you've learned all the doctrines and truths, but there's something in you that doesn't want to yet live for God. It's, this, it's what Paul is talking about. You're still in the flesh. You're still the man of the world. You, it's foolishness to you. You don't know if you want to do it yet. You have to be put to death first and allow the Holy Spirit now to set up residence. And now you start to see the wisdom of the Christian's way of life before you cannot see it. And you don't want to live it. And that's why Wednesday nights are bare and the health message don't mean that much. And, and being a Christian witness isn't that important. And loving your neighbor is not a big deal. And giving your life and heart and soul and mind to God is eh, when I can. I think that most people need to be actually rebaptized. And I would not even call it rebaptism. I would call it baptism for the first time. And that was the tragedy of my baptism. I knew nothing of this dying business. I knew nothing of what it actually meant. And my sins remained. My old life remained. Everything was foolishness to me. And of course, you know the outcome. I've told you quite often here what the outcome meant for me. It was death. It was like physical death. It was like a life of misery, a life of sorrow and trouble. And to this very day, I still suffer the consequences of some of those mistakes I made back when I was just a teenager. Because somebody forgot to tell me what was actually going on and what it meant, and give me a fighting chance. I didn't have a fighting chance at all against myself. And this is why you must be put to death, because it has tremendous power. When God shows up in your life and he asks you to do something, he shows you something you didn't know, it's no problem. Why is it no problem? Because you are dead. It's not your life no more. No matter what he asks you, I want you to start eating this way, dress this way, listen to this kind of music. I want you to quit doing this. I want you to start doing this. I want you to get involved here. And it's like if you're dead, it's no problem. It's only a problem if you're not dead. That was a reality check for me. When the Christian's life was a problem and something that maybe I didn't want to engage all the way, it was a sign that I had never died to self that I had never been truly put to death. So what does it really mean in practical terms? I want to I have a little illustration I always use to demonstrate what this means in practical terms. So here is our life. Here's everything. This these cups are going to represent everything that's you. Your time, what you wear, what you read, what you watch, things we say, attitudes, behaviors, your sexuality, your love, your forgiveness, your forbearance with others, your attitudes as a Christian, uh, your church service, pride, self-seeking, money. I mean, I got everything here that can kind of 
show you this is our life, your resentments, your grudges, your hostilities, your everything. What this is, this, this is you. This is everything that makes me, me. What does it mean to be put to death? Are we talking about, we got to be careful here for a second, but bear with me. Are we talking about individual sins? When you're baptized and you're put to death, you're saying, okay, God, I'm going to start working on, okay, what I watch. I'm going to, if you show me, I'm put to death. I'm going to show you. This is how I used to do this. There's another one, a hidden one. Ah, food and what we eat. <laughs> so I used to do this, this little illustration saying, so when God tells me I'm dead to self, then that means I'm working on entertainments. I'm working on food. I'm working on how to spend my money. I'm going to work. I'm going to whatever God tells me, I'm going to, I'm going to be dead to self and I'm going to do it. I've learned something different since then, what actually dying to self means. We're going to take a little scriptural journey to understand what dying to self actually is. And we're going to go into the book of Romans again, where Romans is talking about being you was buried and dead in baptism and raised to the newness of life. In Romans chapter 6, verse 12 through 14, there are some words used. And Paul in, in these verses says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust thereof. Neither present your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but present yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So Paul, in the context of talking about dying to self and baptism being a symbol of death, he uses a word there. It's a presentation of yourself. You are now presenting yourself to God as dead to the old man and now alive to Christ. And I love how he says, for you are not under the law, but under grace. In other words, the law cannot save you. It can only point out sin. But now you are under grace and a new power is going to come into your life and begin dealing with sins. But dying to self is primarily first and foremost a presentation of yourself to God. Another word that makes this much more clearer that we can use and it's also found in Romans. I'm going to read three quick texts. I'm not even going to read all the text. I'll just say this. Wherefore, God also gave them up. God gave them up. Romans 126, Romans 128. And God gave them over. That word to be gave over is the word paradidomi. And it means to surrender. God surrendered them to themselves. But it's interesting in Romans 6 verse 17, he uses the exact same word this way. But God be thanked that. Though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, to which you were surrendered. So really dying to self is not about the sinning and sins in my life. It is about the surrender of myself to God. This is primarily what he's after. When you die to self, when you're baptized, it is about surrendering my life. My old life is dead. It's gone. I don't exist no more. I have no power over my sins, God. They ruled me when I was in the flesh. And now I surrender my life to you. And like we read in the hymn 518, now daily we live by the Spirit's sword. Through the Spirit daily, God then can start working on the sins the things in, in your life that he wants you to deal with. But primarily, baptism is this. It's giving your life to him. No longer in control of it. No longer trying to manage all of this. No longer coming to him like, okay, I got to start working on this and I got to start working on that and I got to get this thing right and I'm going to really try hard. God's like, I, I get it, but I need you to surrender to me and I'll work on those things for you in you through the Spirit, which is how the plan of salvation works. Because I've spent a lot of my life trying to work on my attitudes, my sexuality, my behaviors, what I watch, what I see, what I eat. And it's this back and forth tennis match that drives you nuts. But when you die to self and you surrender the life to God, you're saying it's your life, including all of this, and you deliver me. Your spirit delivers me as you wish. 
as you want to. It's why we got to give people a break that are coming into the church. We don't know how the Spirit's working in their life yet. We can't ever be the Holy Spirit. We've got to let God be that in people. All right. And so this is how and what baptism is. It's really nothing more than the word surrender yourself to him. A great text that we use in our church back in 1900, when people began to understand this, Ellen White wrote this. The Lord calls for a decided reformation. And when a soul is truly reconverted, let him be rebaptized. Let him renew his covenant with God, and God will renew his covenant with him. Reconversion must take place among the members. That is, God's witnesses, they may testify to the authoritative power of the truth that sanctifies the soul. So if you really want sanctification, you really want transformation and change, you've got to make sure that your baptism was a funeral first. And if you've never done that, maybe rebaptism is for you, or even rebaptism, <laughs> re rebaptism might be for you. And I've had a lot of trouble with this in different places that I went. And um, one place that I went to, we had, man, it was, a, it was a pretty big venue. We had maybe 30 or 40 people stand up for rebaptism. The conference president says, no way, we don't rebaptize here. That's only for people that's left the church, gross out in sin. And then I read him one simple thing. I said, you know that Ellen White was baptized at 17 as a young Methodist girl. She understood a lot of the gospel and things. But when she turned 30, she learned the true gospel, the full gospel under the three angels' message, all its components and workings parts. And she told her husband one day, James White, I need to be rebaptized. And uh, her grandson records records this moment in her life when James White baptized her or rebaptized her. She received rebaptism into the third angel's message. And James White writes, as I raised her up out of the water, immediately she was in vision. Immediately God put a seal of approval on someone who we consider to be a, the gift of prophecy in this church that said, I didn't understand all the components of the gospel. When she understood the first, second, third angel's message and all these pieces that we're talking about together, she's like, I need to recommit to the Lord in a new way. Maybe God is calling for some of you to recommit also in that new way. Without it, we remain this way. The new birth is as a rare experience in this age. Think about how long ago this was wrote. The new birth is as rare experience in this age of the world. This is the reason why there are so many perplexities in the churches. Many, so many who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. They have been baptized, but they were buried alive. Self did not die, and therefore they did not rise to the newness of life in Christ. They were working on their sins, maybe. But they never surrender their life to the one that can do the work for them. Through faith, through his spirit's power, they never gave him total control. Oh, they gave him access to some sins. Yeah, I shouldn't be drinking no more and I probably should quit committing adultery. We can, we can give God all kind of things. But the real trick is to give him the self and let him deal with what's over here, how he wants to do in your life. Now that is what she's talking about, will make all the difference in the world. Have some of you been buried alive or reburied alive? So where have we come to and what things have we actually been going through these past three nights? Monday night, you were asked to come to Christ, and you did. Tuesday night, you was asked to yield your heart in repentance. Tonight, you're being asked to die to self, to surrender the life to God. And maybe that is a baptism for the first time. Maybe it's a rebaptism. Maybe it's a re rebaptism, or maybe not. Maybe that's not for you, but we surely want to offer that to you tonight. As we have, we're going to have some baptisms. Bailey's going to have some baptisms uh, Sabbath. I would like to have some rebaptisms. But I want you to be thinking about that as we continue on. And in fact, if you haven't been put to death, you may identify with this. You become a, oh, I like this, 
you become a spiritual zombie. Most of my life, I was a spiritual zombie. I was supposed to be dead, but I was alive halfway. And come to church, and you're like the zombie of the church. You're angry. You're mad. You're inconsolable. You stir up problems and things, and you find yourself gossiping and angry and writing and saying evil things and mad things, and you're not in a good mood, and no one wants to mess with you, and you wonder what's wrong with your life. I'd love to ask this question to some, but the some that probably need to hear it are not here. What is wrong is you've been buried alive. You're a zombie. You're not alive in Christ. You've never been put to death. You probably have never even went to step number one. You've never come to Christ. It's a progression. You see how the gospel leads you. Jesus is gentle. He's leading you. Come, come. Yes, just come follow me as you are. Yep, as you are now Will you yield your heart to me? Well, sure, I'll yield my heart to the one that loves me. And then a little bit down the road, he's like, will you die for me? Because I'm going to die for you. I'm going to give up all of heaven for you. Will you give up this world for me and follow me and have a life in me that is way better than anything you could ever live in this world anyway? This is what he's asking for us to do. And it's here that the forgiveness of sin actually is predicated upon this. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Your sins are absolutely not yet even forgiven until you've absolutely been baptized and actually died to self. Because until you've died to self, those sins, you were still over here. You're still fighting them, but God will not forgive them until he sees a desire in your heart to die to the old world. And to become alive in him. And now when you're in Christ, those sins, where do they stay? They stay in the grave. In fact, this is where you can even give your guilt away. It's absolutely free and to be put to death because of all the old life. The guilt that comes with it. The shame that comes with it. I was doing a a wedding for one of my family members back home in Louisiana. I was there having a good time. We came to the reception and, you know, down there they like to... They like to shake a leg, so to speak. And my sister-in-law came up to me and she had two cups like this. And they were about half full. You know what's in the cups. She says, come on, Damon, have a drink with me. And she put it up to me. I could smell it was the kicking chicken. It was wild turkey. It's like, whew. I said, Leslie, I don't I don't do that no more. And she went, oh, I know the old Damon. And I looked at her and I said, Leslie, you knew the old Damon. That guy that you're talking about, I gave her the gospel right there that night. I said, that guy has been put to death. He's gone. He's checked out. He don't exist no more. Everything that you knew me, all the foolish things that I can imagine that she saw running through her mind of me when I'm drinking and partying out there and trying to be funny and laughing and doing stupid, humiliating, debasing things, watching me puke in the yard, watching me scream and yell at her sister. All of that, all that guilt that came with it is gone. And you got to believe that. That is why God gave us such a rich and beautiful ceremony. Because when that water goes down the drain and out the pipe, there goes your guilt too. There goes everything that was once you, it's now gone. God needs you to get rid of it. Because it's that guilt that Satan can bring back into your mind. And you can't be free from that guilt until you're dead to self because it will come back and you will indulge it and play with it and imbibe it. And Lucifer, we're told that Lucifer uses our guilt. There's a place for guilt, but a really short amount of time in your life that leads to repentance. And we're told that if you let guilt hang around your life, Satan can use guilt to bring you right back to where you came from. So God's like, I need you to get rid of it. And the only way to get rid of it is the way that I have prescribed to get rid of it. But you also got to let go of life. You got to let go of the unfair things that happen to you. I I think I could put another cup up here, which I've never done before. But we could put another cup up here and call this cup life. The things that happen to us in life. The unfair things, the unjust things, the horrible things 
God wants life, the old life, all of it to be buried. He wants you to come up new and let go of everything that was once you, that people still characterize you by, that people might still see you by, that you still in the night worry about. Just the other night, I woke up weeping in my sleep, thinking about my family that's cut me off and thrown me out like a dog, and it was bothering me so bad just two nights ago that I, I woke up with a sickness in my heart and I began to weep at the loss of my mother and my brothers and my nieces and my nephews. But God reminded me quickly the next morning, Damon, that is not, that's the old, what happened? You've got to let it go, man. You're a new creation in me. And if they want to be a part of your life in the future, if I can bring that around, I will. That's my job. If you give me your life by giving me your life, I can take care of even your life. Does that make sense? This is what baptism is powerful. We was just told it was some cheeky little ceremony. No, it is everything to take this step tonight. And the term for this whole process that we're talking about leading up to this moment in your life is what Romans says in verse five, chapter 5, verse 8 through 9. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if indeed we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Bible calls this whole process from where we started last Friday night till tonight justification by faith. This is how God justifies us. This is how God is able to present us before the Father. Because he's not presenting this Damon. He's presenting this Damon that is now in Christ. And as I take that step, that is actually the ceremony. That is the death and then the marriage, the covenant. I'm reuniting myself. It's the adoption. And God and Jesus can bring me before the Father, before the law, and say, this is my son. He's adopted. He's in me. And my life covers him. And we are justified in this. Galatians 3, verse 27, is talking about the new life in baptism. And Luther wrote this in the 16th century. To put on Christ, according to the gospel, means to clothe oneself with the righteousness Wisdom, power, life, and spirit of Christ. By nature, we are clad in the garb of Adam. This garb Paul likes to call the old man. Before we can become the children of God, this old man must be put off, as Paul says in Ephesians. The garment of Adam must come off like soiled clothes. I love it. Of course, it is not as simple as changing one's clothes. But God makes it simple. He clothes us with the righteousness of Christ by means of baptism. 1535 commentary. I love it. We must like, oh, have you ever been in old work clothes? I, as an electrician, man, I have been in the most nastiest, muddy, gross, dirty, dusty places and itching and junk all over. You just can't wait to get out of those clothes. I can't wait to get out of them and just get them off me and get in the tub and get up and put on my nice flannel pajamas. Are you in dirty clothes? and your soul knows you need to get out of them, you can put them off by getting wet, being buried, being baptized, and coming up in Christ. But we must not be unclear. We must keep Christ on. We must stay in the relationship. We'll talk about that tomorrow, how that works in Friday. But justification isn't just this one-time thing that some make it to be. It's something that must be a just, and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place and in order for now, and we'll start to work on the sins as soon as the Holy Spirit shows up. How can you work on the sins without the Holy Spirit in this way that baptism provides? It's an impossibility. Sometimes I think we ask too much of people before they're baptized. Because the power to overcome sin is what will follow next. What God wants 
is a commitment to the truth, for sure, but he wants the heart. And the old life will come off as God has demanded it to be. So there is a, a surrendering, and then God deals with the cups. Now, what about this idea of playing around with sin, though? Like, we've got to be careful. I'm always trying to be balanced. Steps to Christ is balanced, and we've got to be careful because this thought is something that we need to think about because maybe some of you have never really been buried and put to death, and you still got all kinds of sins. You're constantly fighting and then back and forth with. We must be careful because this is why you got to die to self. Even one wrong trait of character, one sinful desire persistently cherished will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. Every sinful indulgence strengthens the soul's aversion to God. So it's not all the things that don't, you don't struggle with. It's the one thing that you won't let go. Maybe your whole life there has been the one thing that you won't let go. And you can't let go because you've never surrendered the life to Christ to take total control. And Christ doesn't want a half heart, does he? He wants a whole heart given to him because he's going to do a whole work in you as a result. What happens if we do sin? Thank goodness for 1 John 2, 1, if we do mess up after baptism. If we do let something get in between us and Christ and we do indulge the flesh and sin. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Get back to the wheel of faith. Get back to coming to me. Repent. Go through the, give it back to God. There's a place. We're not saying that you won't never mess up once you give your life to Christ. God's like, I don't want you to ever mess up. You don't ever have to mess up after you come to me. But the flesh will often raise its ugly head. And sometimes we'll sin and get these cups going again. And God's like, I'll forgive you but you got to give your heart back to me again. That doesn't mean we have to be rebaptized every time we sin. There's a place for that in the daily life of true repentance now. But now I want to start wrapping this thing up with like the, like the bigger, an even a bigger idea about baptism. Why was Jesus baptized? Why was he baptized? He didn't need to be, or did he? Not because of sin, but Matthew answers the question. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So Jesus came. What does that mean? Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness through his baptism. Well, it has this kind of two ideas to it. In other words, the Bible says that when we're baptized, number one, we're reckoned dead with Christ. In other words, the law demands your death for being a transgressor. So when we're baptized, God says you're being reckoned dead with him. Your symbolic death has been recognized as a real death through the death of Christ. That makes sense. And the second thing is when Jesus came up out of the water, what happened to him? The Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus was already filled with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit now comes and prepares him to go through Matthew chapter 4, which is the temptation to do battle with sin. And how did he do battles with sin? His own power? He did it by faith. He did it through believing and trusting in his Father, and he overcame every temptation by the Spirit's constant saying, son, trust in your father, trust in your father, trust in your father. Here comes Lucifer, trust in your father. The spirit kept Christ constantly centered upon his father and he overcame every sin by faith, not by his divine power. You will overcome the cups, (laughs) the sins in life, not because I got to quit sinning, I got to die to self. You will overcome by faith. You keep your life surrendered to Christ and Christ through the spirit will work on the sins. And he'll get rid of all of them if we give him access and full access. Galatians 2 verse 20 says it this way. You'll see both of those aspects. For though for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but who? But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Church, man, isn't that what we need? 
Don't you think that it's time for the Adventist church at Broad to confess that we cannot do it? The work that God has given us is too large. We've failed for 180 years and it looks more dismal and bleak every generation. It is time for the church to realize that we need to be dead as a church. As a denomination, we need to come before the God and say, I cannot do what you've given us to do. But if we will surrender our life individually and as a church to Christ, he will live his life through us and the work will be done. The life that I now live, I will die. I will live by faith. You can overcome your issues of life. The things that you think that are just so part of your DNA and so part of your character that you just can't get rid of, you will never get rid of until you have surrendered your life to Christ. And now the Spirit will recognize an empty tomb and come in and fill your life with the Holy Spirit. And Christ, through the Spirit, will overcome and you will have a life of victory. I am pretty sure that that is what so many of us in our good denomination needs. One great more quote. The proud heart strives to earn salvation, but both our title to heaven and our fitness for it are found in the righteousness of Christ. The Lord can do nothing toward the recovery of man until, convinced of his own weakness and stripped of all self-sufficiency, he yields himself to the control of God. And then he can receive the gift that God is waiting to bestow. From the soul that feels his need, nothing is withheld. He has unrestricted access to him in whom all fullness dwells. I couldn't think of a more powerful quote. All that he wants is everything. He wants your whole life. Surrender the life to him and you have access to what? Everything. Maybe your life needs that everything now, today. Maybe you've had some things, but you won't. Whatever everything is, I'm pretty sure it's going to be fascinating for you. Whatever that everything is, I am absolutely sure God has a plan for you. But friends, you have got to make sure that we are dead, graveyard dead. I'm not going to call for you to come forward tonight for baptism. I think it's such an important thing that you need to pray about it. I think you need to go home tonight and tomorrow leading up to Sabbath and say, Maybe I need to be rebaptized, actually truly put to death. If that is your desire, we will put you to death properly. And then we will claim as you come up out of those waters, as you go down in the waters, you go down thinking this is it. I'm dead. I'm out. I am surrendering my life to him for the first time, maybe. And when I come up out of them waters, we are going to we are going to claim every promise that we read tonight. And who knows? what God has for you. Until then, until we do that as a church and as individuals, as family members, we're going to continue to sing hymn 309. <laughs> the way that we have sung it, having not given our lives to Christ, the hymn that you all know, 309 is what? I surrender some. Some to Jesus. I surrender some to him I sometimes give. I will sometimes love and trust him in his presence, sometimes live. I surrender some. Oh, I surrender some. Some to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender some. Are you tired of singing it that way? Are you tired of living it that way? Do you want to start living it the way that we'll sing it together tonight? I want you to begin to think. Maybe you have been like the man in John chapter 5. The man that had been by the pool of Bethsaida for 38 years, waiting for the waters to be troubled, 
waiting for what little strength he had left to get to the waters to be healed. And when his strength gave way, he was waiting for somebody to come bring him to the waters. And that somebody came. That somebody was Christ that showed up and said, man, do you want to be made well? And he says, I have no one to get me in the water. Isn't that true? We have no one to get you to the water. Nobody, not even yourself, can bring you to the waters that will heal your life. Nobody. But Christ will. And Christ looked at him and said, do you want to be made well? And then he said, get up and walk. This is what God has waiting for you. It is the moment in your life that God has brought you here tonight. At this time in your life, do you want to be put to death? If that is your desire, get up with myself or Pastor Bailey tonight, tomorrow, the next day, and make that decision. I promise you, God will abundantly do what he has promised if you surrender your life to him. Think about that as we sing, baby.
still go up together. Father God, Lord, you've been speaking to us all week. And Lord, um, we're just asking that the Holy Spirit would continue to guide each and every one of us closer and closer to Jesus. Lord, I'm standing here with some brothers and sisters who have come forward simply expressing their desire to know where and how you're leading them next. If a recommitment or perhaps a commitment for the first time to truly die to self is what you're calling them to make. Lord, um, we know that many of the struggles that exist within our church is because too many of us are alive and well. We haven't truly been crucified with you, we haven't been dead and washed and red. Lord, we desperately need the cleansing power of your blood to do its atoning work in our lives. And so, Father, we're calling upon you to continue to convict and to lead and to guide and to search our hearts and to draw us unto you with that everlasting love. Lord, we're grateful that you have been long-suffering with us, that you have never given up on us, and that you sent Jesus not just to die for us, but to live the life which we could not live. Lord, I pray that you would lead and guide my friends standing here with me. And Lord, if there's somebody out there tonight that, that's wrestling, not sure if you're calling, Lord, I pray that you would send your spirit to continue wrestling with them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.